The 6.5 is on the road here in Las Vegas at AWS reInvent 2024. It has been an incredible conference and unsurprisingly, uh, a lot of discussion about AI. Uh, with any major transition, you always get back to the basics. And some of these basics are getting your data estate in order and securing your data estate. In fact, uh, one of the number one impediments to enterprise AI uh, is uh, securing the data estate and also the governance around all of this data. Security is top of mind, securing that data uh, when it's in movement, uh, when it's in storage, when it's being processed uh, is key. So security is top of mind here. In fact, uh, one of the first things that uh, AWS said on stage was security. And I can't think of a better guy to talk about security than the CEO of Cohesity, Sanjay Poonin. Sanjay, welcome back to the 6.5. Thank you, Pat, great to be with you. And Congratulations on all you're doing with 6.5. No, I appreciate that. Um, gosh, uh, I have a lot of fun talking to you. I feel like we're, no, we're friends years. together, known yeah. each other uh, for a while. And Many it's almost years. like, I want to start macro here. Uh, you have this Im impending acquisition of part of Veritas' uh, business here, but I want to go larger than that. Let's talk about some of the trends in M&A in the security market. And uh, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I think if you look at you know the deals that have been done this year, they've been more sort of tuck-in acquisitions. Uh, right. You know, uh, Palo Alto has been acquiring a few, uh, Zscaler, a few others. CrowdStrike has done the more tuck-in acquisitions. There've been nothing major. The big last big one was Cisco buying Splunk. Right. So we've tracked those. Um, you know, we play in sort of infrastructure and security. In our space, uh, the Cohesity transaction to buy the Veritas data protection business is the biggest in our industry probably since EMC bought Data Domain. So this one will certainly record up there uh, as the, the biggest in our industry. It's a seven, seven and a half billion dollar transaction and it's a very exciting one. And we talked about this, uh, you know, uh, seven, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months ago, February, I think, when we announced it and uh, we expect to close by the end of this year and I'm very excited about it. So it has a lot, a lot of excitement. I've been meeting customers here. They're all very excited about the potential. Yeah. So. It's funny, probably starting about seven or eight years ago, and this is classic for, for what we see historically, is you get a lot of kind of point products that are out there, a lot more point products, and then customers, they, they, they want to deal with less vendors because by the time you stitched all of these things together, you're typically not in the same uh, revision. So this makes, this makes per perfect sense. I'm curious, um, why is cyber resiliency becoming uh, so, so important. Is it this AI data explosion? Is it, you know, something other than that? I mean, all we seem to want to talk about these days is, is, is data driven by AI. Yeah, I think you've hit, I think the two reasons, and I think you called out well in your prelude, which was Matt Garman started off his keynote with security. Yes. Uh, so when you have, you know, whatever, it's two, 300 services that they have, I think him grounding, and I thought he did a great job as a keynote. I've been a friend and fan of his for many, many years. Uh, I think there's two reasons that there's a lot of interest in resilience in general. Number one is what you described. Data is exploding, but it's also sprawled. Right. Uh, in the private cloud, it's going to be VMware, Red Hat, OpenShift, Nutanix. In the public cloud, it's going to be AWS, Azure, Oracle, Google. Um, and then you've got SaaS applications too. So you put that all together, the data is exploding. Many of our customers, the amount of data they uh, protect with us is doubling every six, 12 months. Right. Um, so that's one. The second factor is, I think in the last five years, um, there's been, you know, ransomware attacks that are one, you know, one every few milliseconds, 200 every second, uh, not all of them successful, have all been on secondary and backup data. Uh, largely because you could think of backup True data, ransomware. secondary data as just a time series index of everything that you have over the history of time. So the bad guys decided if we can go after secondary data, we can probably you know, incur a lot more damage to you. Uh, we could also exfiltrate and you'll probably pay us the ransomware. So I think that that's for those two reasons, data exploding being uh, fairly complex and, and sprawled and ransomware attacks being often on secondary data has really put a lot of focus on speed of cyber recovery. Has the fractalization of the enterprise increased or is it kind of leveling out? I mean, we have Traditional, we have traditional on-prem, uh, you have on-prem cloud, you have, um, you have the edge. 
uh, you have enterprise SaaS, and then you have the hybrid multi-cloud out there as well. Has that um, calmed down a little bit, or do you do you see more data sprawl? Is it actually increasing, or is it is it flatlining? Yeah, I think you know this is a question I asked myself for the eight years that I was at VMware, as you know, a COO there. Um, I'd say a couple of things I've noticed in the last twelve months. Number one, um, there has been an increased kind of you know balance of private cloud and public cloud because right. of the notion of sovereign clouds, especially outside the U.S. Right. Uh, many of the customers I've met here are in foreign countries, Germany, Middle East. They're all thinking about sovereign clouds. So I do think that that the pendulum hasn't swung so much just to public cloud. It's not going to be a 99, 1, or 95, 10, it might be 70, 30, or 50, 50 uh, over time. The other aspect is in the private cloud, you know, there are options, it's going to be VMware, but there's also now because of some of the things that are going on in the industry, right. um, Nutanix and Red Hat have an opening, right? I think VMware will do very well, I'm still a fan, uh, inside their enterprise of, let's say, 1,500, 2,000 accounts. Yeah. But there are 200,000 customers of VMware who many of them are going to look at some optionality potentially, and Nutanix and Red Hat have an option. So those phenomenon have been uh, more. And then I think the third thing that has led to a little bit more fractalization, to use your word, has been proliferation of more SaaS apps. So, and customers realizing, I can't depend on the SaaS vendor for resilience of my data. Right. So if all my documents are in OneDrive, and Azure goes down, it's my documents. And I need to be responsible for my emails, my documents. Same with Salesforce, same with Workday. So if all of your documents are in a drive of that kind, if your customer master is in Salesforce, if your accounting master is in some ERP system, and if your employee master is in Workday, it's your data. Right. You probably want to have one repository controlled by hopefully a tool like Cohesity to bring all your data resilience. So uh, I think there'll be a balance. It's not going to be 300 SaaS apps. There's probably 10 that you care about. Sure. It's not going to be 300 public clouds. It's going to be four or five that you care about. There's probably not going to be 300 private cloud options. It's going to be two or three. So what we've done is map for our customers the matrix of what the possibilities are, and then we will go workload by workload and map out what their resilience strategy should be. Sound like you got you have it covered. I mean, you know, we thrive in heterogeneity. We're like a Switzerland company, right? Sure. If the entire world was AWS, you don't need Cohesity. Right. They'll go do backup for AWS. So the fact that there's four public clouds, we love that. VMware and Nutanix, we love that. So not infinite amount of heterogeneity, but enough heterogeneity that there's a proposition for a Switzerland company like us is great. Yeah, I mean, I view you as a hybrid multi-cloud fabric exactly. uh, for what you do. I want to get back to, I want to talk about cyber resiliency, and you recently did a study, a global cyber resilience report. Can you tell me a little bit about what the report uh, brought out? What were some of the surprises that, that, that came out of it? I think I'm surprised when I see any of these reports, whether it's ours or uh, others, how much people are still worried that they can't recover fast enough okay. from a cyber attack. Uh, they worry that, you know, they, they... And that's not just restore, it's actually getting back up and your operational. Applications, right? yes. Your applications need to be up, and your applications might be tier zero, tier two, and so speed of cyber recovery, I've often been surprised that every, it's not just our survey results, but everybody tells us they don't have confidence that if they were attacked, that they can recover fast enough. Right. That's something that we as an industry have to. Let's just take the most recent, it wasn't a cyber attack, okay? The CrowdStrike incident was not a cyber attack. Right. But what we learned from that incident was the fact that enterprises were uh, restoring their laptops manually, and it took many of these companies and airlines and other people who were affected days. Yeah. That's unacceptable. So I think speed of recovery, whether it's a cyber attack, I mean, the next time if it's something major is that we should be able to just restore things in minutes and hours, not like days and weeks. Um, I think that I found, out, what I found interesting in all the survey, including what we've seen in our survey, is people are putting their data in public clouds and they don't know for sure is that going to be a place where it's as safe and so on and so forth. So interesting, we have to, that's still out there. I mean, yeah. listen, if I put documents in a OneDrive, am I comfortable that it's going to be completely safe as it is on-prem? Will I have accesses to it safely? Am I comfortable with my customer data sitting in Salesforce? Right. And I think a derivative of that is when I use an LLM that's a public cloud LLM, okay, I'm sending data to it. If I have a private cloud LLM, then it's within my firewalls. So companies need to get very comfortable. Many of them have disabled 
uh, early use of OpenAI and ChatGPT because they didn't want sure. people sending out their press release to get a more perfect version into a public cloud. Right. So many of those things now mean that the way in which you think about data security in a AI-driven world, in a world where the data is proliferated, has to be rethought. But from our perspective, the number one takeaway is speed of cyber recovery is something that needs to improve. That's kind of the hallmark of what Cohesity does. Sure. So it plays well to where we want to continue to focus our attention with our customers. Yeah, and I, I, I have to give you credit. I do like, you kind of reset the metric. It's not just how quickly you can back up. It's not just how quickly you can restore. It's literally how, how quickly you can get back online exactly. with what you want to do. Because in the end, that is what your customers care about. Yep, that's good. We, we've focused a lot on the simplification of our message uh, Pat, around speed, scale, security, simplicity, smarts. We call it the five S's, okay? And I remind people the sixth S isn't Sanjay. It sounds five very S's. much a Sanjay yeah. thing. <laughs> but a simple way of being able to explain things to people. Right. And I tell our engineers, we need to distinguish our platform by the excellence of those five S's. Right. We have to be the simplest and easiest to use, the smartest in AI. Right. Last time we talked, we talked a lot about NVIDIA and AI and what we're doing with them. Security is obviously, we spent a lot of time talking about, but speed and scale go together. They're two sides of the same coin. No, I like that. That's good. I want to go macro again. Yeah. I want to look to 2025. We're almost uh, almost done here. Uh, let's talk, what are your thoughts on uh, IPO market, M&A market, and maybe even some thoughts about the new administration? Let's take it one at a time. I mean, obviously in our industry, this is the biggest M&A deal that's been done, so we're excited about it. We've got to make it successful. As right. it closes, we'll go into the new uh, 2025 as the new Cohisti that's, you know, closes out the last fiscal year is 1.7 billion, approaching a 2 billion run rate. So we will be the biggest in revenue, a rule of 40 plus companies. So we're very excited about that possibility. Uh, IPO, uh, you know, in our space rubric went public. I think the, the market could support three or four companies being public. Commodore right. Rubrica public, it's possible we could go public, Veeam could go public, there's right. at least four. And there are other spaces where that's resonance. I think 2025 and 2026 will be even better IPO years. 2024 was okay, yeah. it will be even better. So I see M&A uh, and, and IPO being actively good. Interest rates coming down is helpful for the general macro in terms of finance and banks are very optimistic. 2022, and sort of the end of the COVID era was a tough time as people kind of recalibrated. But profitable growth is the imperative. I mean, part of the reason we did this deal was to improve our profitability and keep our growth. Right. And now By it's the way, a and, 40 and company. It's just fantastic. The fact you have profits is is good. Well, we were profitable, barely profitable ourselves, right. uh, cohesively, but now on a free cash flow basis, now this makes us even more profitable. Right. But profitable and growth, that's a very, very big key factor to it. I think the administration were cautiously optimistic. I think, listen, we, as business leaders, we don't take a political stance, red or blue. Right. We basically want to work, in our case, to keep the country safe uh, from attacks. So, you know, red or blue person in administration, if their keys is to keep America safe, if I could use that right. term, and they're competent and capable, uh, we have an incredible country. I think, you know, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country in 19, late 1980s, 1987 to be specific, became a citizen, I think, what, 20 years ago. Um, it's an incredible country where if you work hard, anything's possible. So I encourage everyone to live that American dream, which is, you know, work hard, be a, a contributing member to society. Um, you know, religion and politics can sometimes divide people. So right. I have my personal beliefs, but I don't talk about them in a way to divide. Our customer base expects us to serve them. And one of our key verticals is the public sector. Right. So we have federal customers um, in both civilian and defense. We have public sector customers in state local. And many of the things we learn from the US government, especially in the federal, become the model. So uh, I view that and then we have uh, Kevin Mandia who's on our board, uh, you know, who ran and built Mandiant. He's an advisor to many of the key folks. Uh, I have friends in the administration and in key positions there. We will work with them to ensure, you know, we keep the country safe. I think AI has to be dealt in a very responsible way. So I expect there to be technology and legislation, executive orders that basically surround and keep AI responsible. But, you know, you think there also, I mean, gosh, some of the greatest minds in AI, whether it's Jensen or some of the folks on the United States, right? we could use this as an incredible power to, uh, uh, you know, to, to harness the next generation of tech just the same way 
whether it was CPUs or airplanes like Boeing or software, great companies like Google were all born here. I think the next wave is going to be incredible for the next 10 years. Yeah, I'm super interested to see uh, there's this push and pull between, hey, we're going to lower, we want to lower expenses. Uh, but then again, we want to update the federal government's IT systems that are, are pretty age, aged. And, and I think if we get into this upgrade cycle, this could be huge uh, for companies like, like yours. Yeah, listen, I, you know, Department of Efficiency, if there's ways in which the government can be more efficient. I think we have to, as optimists, tend to look and say, listen, we're going to do whatever we can with the right people who are smart and capable um, to make, you know, the best happen out of the technology with the private sector. And I think the thing that I've liked about the last several administrations, whether they were a Republican or Democrat, is there was a good partnership between the private sector and the public sector. Right. Pat, that needs to continue. Yes. And I don't think that that's a dependent of both, you know, President Trump in his first term, Biden in his last term, and I think Trump the next term will have that partnership between private and public sector. We have a lot of ideas in the pub private sector that we can help the government with, and we want to. Uh, and when we've worked with our senators that I know, uh, the folks in Congress, and the folks who are elected or appointed in these positions of the departments in the Australian or the, 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 or the defense side, we find tremendous amount of resonance in these ideas. So my job in terms of you know, working with the government, because there are many government cus customers and knowing some of these folks in public policy, is to help shape that policy as it relates to cybersecurity and AI. Right. I love your optimism. I'm an optimist too, and I'm pretty excited about uh, 2025 and, and what's going to happen uh, in the future. The other thing I'm excited about is deal close day uh, with you and uh, Veritas Data Protection. So good luck. Thank you um, so um, you know, looking imminent. at the calendar, let it's me know when it happens. Yes. Hit me on I the back phone, you. please. I will text you, I will. Looking I will. forward to it. Sanjay, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Pat. Appreciate your support. Yep. That was uh, Sanjay Poonin, CEO of Cohesity. Great discussion. I love these macro discussions we have here on the 6.5. Uh, tune in to all of our 6.5 media coverage uh, for AWS reInvent 2024. And also check out all of the videos that we have done with Cohesity. We think you'll like it. Tune in. Thanks. <laughs> Let's <laughs> go.